Testing. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. And he is risen. Okay. Uh, I have a few announcements. So uh, during our 1030 service, which this morning is 930, the preschool class will now be opening at the start of the service. So the parents are welcome to drop their children off and keep them uh, or keep them in the sanctuary until dismissal after the children's sermon. So you have your choice with preschool. Uh, Pastor Troy will be on vacation next week, so the church office will be closed on Monday. Uh, there is no youth group this afternoon, so enjoy your Easter with your family. And then the 30 days of prayer for the Muslim world um, is still going on. It's March 10th through the 8th. And then uh, we have a slight change in the palm tree ministry trip. Um, Christendom College has requested that uh, they change, so the visit to Christ the King Chapel from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. on Thursday, April the 11th. So we're moving all of our plans an hour later. So you'll be leaving Westside at 11.30 p.m., having lunch at Cracker Barrel in Front Royal, uh, having 2.30 p.m. tour of the chapel, and then returning to Westside by 5. So if you've registered for this trip, there's just a slight alteration in your plans. And save the date for the Bland Mission trip. Uh, that will be June 9th through the 14th. And uh, I believe that's it. Big test, are we on? Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and stand and start with our opening hymn, The Old Rugged Cross.
Uh, no, well, not yet. Okay. Uh, hey. Um, <laughs> I was like going. I was about to say. I was about to say good evening, hey. but we've already done the Monday Thursday service, so I'm going to say good morning, even though it's 9:30. Uh, so good morning, Westside. Hey, if you're a visitor with us, thank you so much for choosing Westside as your place of worship this morning. In the pew pocket in front of you, you will see a connection card. Uh, if you would kindly fill that out, hold it to the end of the service, and we have a connection booth in the lobby where a member will be there. Take that card from you, answer any questions you may have about Westside, and give you a nice little gift. So uh, with that, let's continue with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we've gathered here this morning to celebrate your son's victory over death and victory over sin. May our words and our actions be an example of his sacrificial love. In your name I pray, amen. Now will you please stand up, mingle with those around you for our meet and greet time. <laughs>
all may be seated. special baptisms that are going to take place today. And I can't think of a better time than on Resurrection Sunday to celebrate in the waters of baptism. And what we have here today is uh, two members from the same family. It's a father and daughter duo that are being baptized here this morning. And I'd like to introduce you to you. This, first, I'll, I'll introduce you to Dad. This is Jimmy Stickley. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Somebody said, hi, Dad. <laughs> All right. Jimmy has prepared just a short testimony. <laughs> no, he hasn't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Jimmy is a man of few words. Almost got knocked out up here in the baptism. Just no, 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 not at all. But Jimmy is here because, you know, he's given his life to Christ some time ago. He's been faithfully coming to this church for about a year now, but he's never been baptized. And we've talked about it, and he just kind of shared his heart a little bit, and he knows that this is what he needs to do. His family wants to officially be members of this church. His, his wife, is he, he has a, a son and a daughter, and his wife is the only one that has been baptized up to this point. So Jimmy's being baptized today. Hannah's going to be baptized here shortly. And then later in the spring, Peyton is going to be baptized in the river down in Bridgewater. And you'll, we'll tell you when that's going to happen in case anybody wants to come out and celebrate with us. But what a joyous occasion this is. Scripture tells us, you know, baptism is symbolic, and I don't want to get ahead of myself because I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the sermon today, but, you know, Scripture talks about how just as Jesus was dead and buried and raised from the grave through the glory of the Father, that's what we do when we enter into the waters of baptism. It is a symbolic representation of being buried and dying to our old life and being raised to walk anew. With our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jimmy, you ready? Yes, sir. Good luck, Daddy. Yeah. <clears throat> Jimmy, I haven't said anything that wasn't true, right? Sure. You were you have given your life to Jesus. Yes. Alright, now I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Right. You may walk in Jesus. interesting because Hannah came to me first. Hannah came first and said, I want to be baptized. And, and then I met with the family and we talked to them and everybody and we decided, you know, we talked about dad hadn't been baptized at all. I said, well, do we need to schedule this? She was like, no, I don't need to wait. She didn't need to wait for anybody. She was ready to do it right there. <laughs> and, it, and it worked out. We, we planned it so that we could be here together. But she was ready to do it. She didn't need to do it with anybody else. She was going to do it on her own accord. Right? Now, did you prepare your testimony for this morning? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Although Hannah probably would do it. She'd probably be like, oh, yeah, I'll tell you. But anyway, Hannah and I talked a little bit. She's taken a, a 
an account and looked at her life and said, you know, I'm ready to make sure I'm living for the Lord. And she's standing here before you, a young lady unashamed of her faith in Jesus Christ. So today, she wanted to prove that, show that to you through this symbolic act of baptism that she has died to her old life and she is going to be living anew for Jesus Christ. Are you ready? I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. At the end of the service, I'm going to call Jimmy and Hannah both to come back down to the front so that we can all pray over them together and then give you a chance to love on them and welcome them, welcome them officially into our West Side family. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let's continue in our time of work. All right, let's go ahead and rise and continue with our worship service.
Thank you. You all may be seated as the ushers come forward. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to worship in your house today and for the praises that we've given. And Father, we thank you for this place that uh, we have to worship, and we thank you for the way that you have blessed our church and us individually. And as we have this opportunity to return a portion of what we have to you, pray that you would bless the gift and the giver and we pray that you would multiply these gifts to be used in your service. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Wow. That's amazing. I got up early to come to the sunrise service. I got excited, and I got into the baptistry a little early. I was excited, and I started to clap a little early before they even finished. And then what a, what a tremendous ending it was. Wow. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, choir. Thank you, worship team. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come down and hang out for just a little bit this Easter Sunday. Good to see you. Hello. You brought your little friend with you. Good. Hi, Stella. I, I halfway thought Blaine was going to come join us when he came by. Put him in the first time. I know. Hello. Hello, sweetheart. Any other kids out there wanting to come and join us? We good? Just making sure. I saw Miss Dolly. It looked like she was getting up. I wasn't sure. All right. Hey. I brought something. Oh, no. Here she comes. I brought something to show you today. <laughs> I brought something to show you today, and I want you to see if you can tell me what it is. Now, you're probably going to have to put your thinking caps on for this one, okay? You ready? I'm going to show you. What is this thing? It's an Easter egg. It's what? An Easter egg. An Easter egg. How do you know it's an Easter egg? How is this different from a regular egg? It's colored. It's colored? It's colored on. Well, so? But so you're saying it's a normal it's a normal egg. Why are they calling it an Easter egg? Because it's Easter. Did this come from an Easter chicken? No. 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 Oh, you got to color it to turn it into an Easter egg. Oh, now I see what you're saying. So this egg is different from other eggs. It's an Easter egg because it's colored to look, it's made up to look pretty, isn't it? Yeah? Now, here's what I want you to see today. This egg is like a lot of people. Now, I'm not talking about the shape because I know some of us are starting to... <laughs> Some of us are starting to be more shaped like this egg. But I'm saying this egg is a lot like people in that sometimes people can make themselves look really purty. Sometimes people can put on the purty clothes and the purty smile, but inside they're not real purty. Now, as people who, who, as people who love Jesus... As people who love Jesus, we want to try to be purdy to the world. We want to, you know, take care of ourselves, and we want to think about the way people see us, and because we represent, we're trying to show people Jesus, right? But it's what's on the inside that matters. What's inside this egg? Yolk. What do you mean, yolk? I'm not trying to be funny. It's not a yolk? Oh, it's got an egg yolk. That's what you're saying. Okay, so let's find out what's inside this egg. Okay? Only if you've boiled it. I didn't say I boiled it. Let's find out. Let's see if we can crack it. Let's see. We can crack it. No, let's crack it right here. Let's see what we can do. Let's find out what's in this egg. I told you this egg is a lot like people. What do you expect to see inside here? Look at this. What do you see in there? That's not you. Wait, is that a real egg? It's a real egg. It's a boiled egg. That's right. That means it's not all, well, it's still squishy, but it's not liquidy like an egg you pour into the pan when you're going to Frank, when you're going to scramble some eggs. Hang on, I'm trying to finish getting this stuff off of here. All right, look here. Now, this egg. Now, what can you tell me about this egg? It's boiled. It's white. Well, you can see a little bit of the color came through. But here's the thing. As Christians, if we look good on the outside, is that all that matters? No, we need to look good on the inside. And when we come to Jesus, we get cleaned 
right? He takes away our sins. So on the inside, we're supposed to be clean, and this white egg represents that. My sins have been forgiven. My sins have been taken away. Otherwise, maybe if I opened this egg, I'd be all dirty and black and gross on the inside. So on the inside is what matters. Jesus came so that we could be clean in our heart and in our mind and in our spirit. And what God gave us, there's one more piece to this egg that I want to show you. When you come to Jesus, he puts something inside you. You know what that is? He puts something inside you, something that gets to come and live with you. Do you know what it is? Well, you have a heart. He sends his Holy Spirit. Let's see if this egg has a Holy Spirit. <gasps> Look at that. Right there inside, there's something inside. There's not another egg. It's the yolk. That's the, usually the yolky part, the runny yolk part. But it lives deep inside the egg, kind of like when you come to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Right? Isn't that pretty special? We need to remember that. It doesn't matter how pretty you are or what kind of fancy clothes or how nice your makeup is or any fancy car you drive. None of that stuff matters. You have a beautiful dress. You really do. But what I like about you, Stella, is that you are beautiful on the inside because you know Jesus. And that's what's important, right? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Easter Sunday. Thank you that we come together on Easter not to chase rabbits and to look hunting for eggs. We come on Easter because we're remembering that you came back from the grave, that you died on a cross, but then God brought you back. You beat death. You took away our sins so that we can be clean on the inside and have your Holy Spirit in our life. Help us to remember that and to love you and to tell people about you, not just on Easter, but every day. Bless these kids and their parents and their families and their aunts and uncles or grandparents or whoever brings them to church. Bless them. In Jesus' name, what do we say? Yeah. Right, nice and loud, nice and loud. Amen. All right, thank you guys. I think Miss Rebecca's going to take you now. There we go, Miss Dolly. Go ahead. Thank you, Miss Dolly. They were dancing in the Baptist church. Oh, my goodness. Relax, Miss Cora. I'll give you a dance later, okay? Steve, I don't know. You look like a toe stepper. <laughs> All right. Man, it's good to be here today. I've been excited since this morning. Uh, you know, I was up yesterday morning when the sun came up, which is not normal for me. And it was 30, 30 couple degrees yesterday morning. It was a, a bit chippy. This morning, it was a good 45 or so. It was nice out there this morning. And for those of you that came, it was really, really good. All right. These kids are wonderful, aren't they? Fantastic. I love... Love, love my time with the kids up here every Sunday morning because you never know what they're going to say. You never know what they're going to do. I know you guys love it because it keeps me on my toes, but it reminds me of a story that I want to share with you this morning. A Sunday school teacher, she once asked a group of children this question, what is Easter? Mary Louise Duggard, age eight, she answered in this way, what is Easter? She said, you get candy, and you look for eggs, and you remember God. That's not a bad answer, right? Jimmy Hogan, age seven, he said, it's the day Jesus woke up. <laughs> Again, that's not bad, right? Amanda Ward, age five, she said this. She said, Easter's when Jesus got alive. I think I really like that one group of four-year-olds in a different Sunday school class were asked this question one Easter sun, uh, Sunday morning. Does anyone know what today is? And one child yelled out in excitement and said, it's Easter's. And the teacher said, that's fantastic. Can anyone tell us what Easter's all about? 
So one of the little girls spoke up and she said, I know, I know. Easter is when Jesus came out of his cave. <laughs> but if he sees his shadow, he has to go back in for seven more weeks. <laughs> and when the teacher corrected the little girl and explained the meaning of Easter, one of the four-year-old boys in the same class became even more confused. He said, uh, you see, this little boy's father was a funeral director. And little Tommy was puzzled by the whole resurrection thing. He asked, do you mean to tell me that Jesus really came back from the dead? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did, said the teacher. And Tommy shook his head and replied, well, I know my daddy didn't take care of Jesus because if he had, he would have never got back up. This leads me to the sermon title for today, The Empty Tomb, What Does It Mean? And I'm going to break this down to uh, just three things, three things for you to consider this morning. Number one, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, but number one is the empty tomb means he is alive, people. The empty tomb means Jesus is alive. He was dead. But he came back to life. Now, I don't know of any other way to explain that to you more simply. Some people have tried to say that Jesus wasn't resurrected. Instead, his body must have been stolen. And that doesn't hold up. It doesn't make sense. Who would have taken the body of Jesus? Let me tell you this. Not the Romans. Because the Romans had no reason to remove Jesus from the tomb. You know why? Because that would have made them look weak. As if they were worried about the disciples or somebody else who would be foolish enough to challenge their authority to try to defeat their soldiers and break the official Roman seal that they had placed on that tomb. No way. The Jewish religious leaders, they didn't steal the body of Jesus. If so, they would, have, they would have produced his corpse shortly after the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had been resurrected. They would have drug his, course, his corpse out from wherever they had it. They would have hung it up on and showed it to everybody and said, uh-uh, look, he's dead. He's still dead. They're lying. And you know they would have jumped at that chance, but they couldn't because they didn't have the body. And if they could have done that, they would have ended Christianity right then and there. Some claim it was the disciples. They must have been the ones who had taken the body from that tomb. Somehow, these followers of Jesus, a group made up of fishermen, a tax collector, and most likely a few other tradesmen, somehow the disciples managed to overpower those professional soldiers who were guarding the tomb without killing them and without any casualties of their own, and they were able to roll away the stone and steal the body of Jesus. Not only that, but these same disciples, they also managed to pull off what would have been, what would have to be considered as the greatest con job in all of history by convincing so many different people that Jesus had in fact risen. From the dead. How would the disciples have pulled that off? How would the disciples have fooled so many people? How could they have done it? Did they fool everyone by using a body double? A look-alike? Maybe Jesus had a twin brother that nobody knew about. And are we supposed to believe that each one of these men were so committed to this deception that they were all willing to suffer and or die horrible, horrible deaths just to cover it up. We know that all the disciples, all of them except for John, died as martyrs in gruesome ways. Are we to believe that they did this to protect some great lie? Not one of them would have cracked under torture and said, okay, I admit it, I admit it, he had a twin brother. No, not one. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 6, specifically states that more than 500 witnesses had seen Jesus alive at the same time. That was at one grouping. People were seeing him alive up to 40 days after the resurrection had taken place. In the last 2,000 years, how can so many people all over the world have been forever changed by coming to know Jesus and by putting their trust in him? How, Alex? This goes far beyond what anyone might call a psychological phenomenon. Maybe you've come to know this by now, but following Jesus, believing in him and in God's plan for the redemption of all mankind that took place through him, through his death and resurrection, this requires faith, people. People have always searched for reasons to doubt, looking to disprove and or deny that Jesus is who he is. But they haven't been able to accomplish that. Because this historical event, it just has too many verifiable, verifiable facts to be disproven or ignored. A fellow by the name of Professor Thomas Arnold was in his time considered to be the foremost expert in historical studies. He was the chair of modern history at Oxford University in the early 19th century and made the following observation. Professor Arnold stated, he said, I have been used for many years in studying the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which has proven any better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer that the great sign which God has given us, that Christ died and rose again from the dead. This is a guy that gets paid to examine historical evidence, to debunk what needs to be debunked, and to prove what needed to be proven. The empty tomb, we talk about that all the time at Easter. The empty tomb has a message for all of us, to science and philosophy. It says, go ahead and explain this event. To history, the tomb of Jesus says, repeat this event. To time, it says, erase this event. To faith, the empty tomb says, believe this event. There's even a theory out there that Jesus didn't actually die. Someone must have made a mistake in pronouncing him dead. Jesus must have simply, the word they use is swooned. He passed out or fainted from the pain, from the blood loss, from the dehydration one lady wrote in and to a question and answer forum that is supported by a popular religious magazine, and this is what she wrote. She said, Dear sirs, my friend said that at Easter that Jesus just swooned on the cross, that he passed out, and the disciples nursed him back to health to make everyone believe that he had been resurrected. What do you think about that? Sincerely bewildered. This is the response she received. It said, Dear Bewildered, see if your friend is willing to test that theory. Beat them about the face and torso for a while. Then whip them using a cat of nine tails with 39 heavy strokes. Force a sharp, thorny crown on their brow. Nail him or her to a cross. Hang this person out in the sun for six hours. Run a spear through his or her side. Then seal them in a tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. Sincerely, Charles. Jesus didn't just faint and be somehow revived by laying in a cool tomb. The blood loss alone would have been enough to kill a normal person. 
It wasn't just that they took a fresh, healthy body and nailed him to a cross. He'd already been beaten. They were having fun with Jesus before he ever got whipped. That cat of nine tails, they stop at 39 because they believe that when they get to 40, it kills someone. He endured all of these things before he was nailed to the cross. This event, the empty tomb, is the foundation of our Christian faith. Both the Romans and the Jewish religious leaders, they would have disproved the resurrection if they could. Believe me, if they could, they would have disproven it. Critics have unsuccessfully tried to do this for 2,000 plus years now. Disprove it. Modern technology, and we've come a long way. We have the world at our fingertips on our iPads and our cell phones. Modern technology and new, newer archaeological finds, they've done nothing but further support the biblical narrative. Now, I'm sure you've heard this before, but God didn't have the stone removed from that tomb so that Jesus could escape so that Jesus could come out. He removed the stone so that everybody else could look in. That's the reason the stone was removed. So we could all see that the tomb was in fact empty, that Jesus wasn't there. Think about it. When Jesus showed up to show himself to the disciples, we are clearly told they were in a locked room, yet Jesus appeared before them. Did he simply materialize through the wall? I don't know what he did. But if he could do that, he certainly could have come out of a tomb that was sealed. And Jesus wasn't there because his body had been taken. Jesus wasn't there because he was alive. Because God had risen him from the dead just as Jesus said was going to happen. Death could not hold on to him because of who Jesus is. Emmanuel, God with us. This belief is so tremendously important. You know, some things don't really matter when it comes to faith in Jesus. Some hills aren't worth dying on. For example, what a person looks like or what they wear to church. These things have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with their faith. If a person walks in the door and is covered from head to toe with tattoos, you cannot look at that person and say, they don't know Jesus. They might be just a little closer to him than you are. West Side is a Baptist church. As you saw this morning, we practice what is known as believer's baptism with immersion, being dunked as our accepted mode of baptism. That means that we only baptize someone who truly seems to understand the profession of faith that they are making in embracing Jesus Christ as their one and only Lord and Savior. And when we do baptize that person, they get dunked or immersed completely into the water. Other churches, they may sprinkle their people. They may pour water over them for baptism. But because they do it differently doesn't mean that we're going to heaven and they are not. Or vice versa. Baptism is not what gets a person into heaven. Faith in Jesus Christ alone is what gets you into heaven. If you don't believe me, ask the thief on the cross. Our big question for this morning, the empty tomb, what does it mean? I said I'd give you three things to consider. I did say I'd spend more time on the first one. The first one was this, the empty tomb means Jesus is alive. We all know that. Number two, the empty tomb, the empty tomb also means forgiveness is yours. 
You can be forgiven and restored in your relationship with God if you want that forgiveness. The fact that Jesus wasn't in that tomb on Easter morning, that says a lot about him. But let me tell you, it also says a lot about you and me. Yes, Jesus loved us enough to die for us. I think we get that. But he did it all. Jesus went to the cross. He gave his life to pay our debts. By that, I mean that, that, that Jesus took the punishment for us. He suffered the consequences for our sins against God, past, present, and future. Because none of us is perfect. Coming to Jesus may mean, yeah, I've been washed clean like the egg I showed you, but we are good at dirtying ourselves right back up. The good thing is, we can, all we have to do is say, Lord, forgive me, and it is done. That's the good thing. Jesus died for your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. Now, that doesn't give you a free pass to go out and do whatever you want to do. You should still want to be obedient to God and what he says is right and good and true. I'm talking about when we slip up, when, which is what we do. We may not do it intentionally. Sometimes we do sin intentionally. But we have a loving God, a God of grace. Jesus died that we can all be forgiven today, yesterday, tomorrow. Placing our faith in Jesus, choosing to follow him, to chase after him, genuinely believing that he is everything this book tells us he is, everything. Choosing Jesus is choosing forgiveness and restoration unto God. I just talked about baptism. In the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says that new believers are to be baptized. And they're to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a symbolic act of obedience for the Christian. It's a public demonstration of your faith, your personal faith in Jesus, showing that you are unashamed of your relationship with him as your Lord and Savior. Being immersed into the water and brought back up again is symbolic of having died. I said this to your old ways before coming to Jesus and then having been cleansed of your sins. I brought Jimmy up out of the water and he looked at me like, you think that was good enough? Maybe you should dunk me again. No, he didn't. It's a symbolic act. Jimmy was cleansed the moment he gave his life to Jesus. That water doesn't have special magical healing properties. But it did show all of you that he is an obedient follower of Christ. Hannah's not ashamed of the decision she made. You have been forgiven and restored to live a new life, one that's devoted to Jesus. The empty tomb is representative of the fact that we've been given a fresh start. We've been given a clean slate with Jesus, by Jesus, through Jesus. If there was a vault that stored up all of our sins against God, that vault is now empty, as empty as that tomb. We're plainly told in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. There's no old self, no record of sins, no unforgiveness or unforgived sin, and no regrets. Because there's no need to dwell in the past. There's no need to dwell on that which has already been forgiven All those things died with Jesus. The empty tomb, what does it mean? I said I'd give you three. Number one, it means Jesus is alive. He was resurrected from the dead. Number two, it means the empty tomb means forgiveness is ours if, if we choose it, if we claim it. Now let's look at the third thing. Number three, the empty tomb means 
it's going to be okay. Did you hear what I said? It's going to be okay. By that, I'm saying that the empty tomb speaks to us about the negative experiences that we will inevitably encounter in this life. We've all had those bad days when we find ourselves facing various trials and tribulations and we're having difficulty seeing the light through the darkness that is all around us. And I say to you, look into the empty tomb and know that through Jesus, there is hope. The psalmist reminds us in the 23rd Psalm, which I bet many of you can quote word for word, even though we may sometimes find ourselves walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't need to fear the evils of this world why? Because God is with us. None of us have ever faced anything quite to the level of what Jesus faced on Friday. Physically, psychologically, emotionally. This doesn't mean that our trials aren't painful. Sometimes they are. Sometimes we suffer. But we never suffer alone even in the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord God is with us. The empty tomb is proof that God can take our greatest struggles, our deepest pains, our heaviest burdens. God can even take the darkest parts of our lives and he can use those things for our own spiritual growth to bolster our faith and for his glory. We've been redeemed by God, by his grace, and we've been done, that's been done for us for his purposes. This speaks of how the bloody hopelessness of Good Friday, a dark day in the history of all the world. Sometimes there's bloody hopelessness in our everyday lives. But the empty tomb explains that these things can be turned into the joyous celebration that is Easter Sunday. I don't know who it is. Maybe you're watching from home. I don't know who it is. But I'm thinking that there is someone here today who needs to hear this. So listen up. Whether it's you or whether it's you watching from wherever... We live in a world that desperately tries to avoid pain and sorrow and death. We don't even like to think about the events that happened on Good Friday. But we are people of faith, and, and our faith says God may not send these things into our lives, not always, but he can use these things. He can redeem even the worst hardships that we may endure, even death itself. Even death itself can be used by God to turn our hearts and our minds toward him, to strengthen our faith, and to solidify the hope that we have in Jesus. So the empty tomb, what does it mean? It means Jesus is alive. It means death and sin have both been defeated. It means we can be forgiven and have been forgiven. And the empty tomb means it's going to be okay. No matter what happens in this world, it's going to be okay. Just keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. The events of Good Friday, they were horrific. They were difficult for us to even imagine Sometimes things hit us out of the blue. Sometimes we just wake up one day and there's a trial that we never saw coming. But Jesus died so that we could live. 
Jesus died so that we could be forgiven and restored. The final thing I want you to think about is that sometimes in our lives there's darkness that comes before the dawn. The empty tomb is proof that God keeps his promises. Nothing is beyond his power or beyond his control. Nothing surpasses the love of God or the grace of God. So I say to you today, praise God for the empty tomb. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. I hope you have special plans today to be with loved ones, family, friends. Celebration, because today is a day of celebration. We're entering into our last time. We're going to sing a song together, and then we'll part ways. And this is our time of response. So I'll just ask, how will you respond to the message of Easter? How will you respond to the fact that your vault, your sin vault, if you've given your life to Jesus, that's been emptied out? Look inside the empty tomb and tell me, what do you see? Jesus is risen. If you're going through a hard time right now, a trial, a tribulation, you're not walking alone. Just reach out your hand and know that the Lord walks with you. He never promised we wouldn't have trials, but he did promise he'd be with us through the trials. Not one of us deserves forgiveness, but it is by his grace that Jesus paid our debt. If you're here today and you don't know him, if you've never given your life to Jesus and said, I admit it, I, I know I've messed up, I know I've sinned against God, and I want to change all that, I believe that you are who the Bible says you are, and I want to give my life to you. If that's you today, I'd love to talk to you about Jesus. If you just need somebody to pray with, maybe you're in, in the middle of the valley of the shadow of death. And I'll have deacons step into the aisle. I'll be up here. I'd be, I'd be honored to pray with you. If you come up to the front and just kneel down and talk to God, you don't have to tell anybody in this building what your issue is. You can keep it to yourself. Keep it between you and the Lord. But don't just carry it out of here by yourself. Remember, he walks with you. If you kneel up here, pray to him, and the rest of us will see you up here. We don't have to know your business but we'll pray over you. So you'll have everybody in this room praying over you as you go into the throne room of God. That's like a warm blanket on a cold winter day. Let's stand. Let's sing one more song as an offering to the Lord.
Day, this uh, this Easter Sunday. Please go and uh, enjoy the remainder of your day. It's a day of rejoicing. It's a day of praise. If you get to be with friends and family, love on them. Thank God for them in your lives. Make sure you pause to remember the great sacrifice that was made for us. Hope to see you all again here next week. You're actually you're in for a treat next week. Our own Merv Webb's going to be bringing the message next Sunday. So you're in for a treat there. Um, what's that? Ice cream? Oh, I don't know. Maybe Merv's going to get you some ice cream. I don't know. Anyway, please enjoy the remainder of the day. Let's, let's pray one more time. God, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for all that, that he did and continues to do for us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for for Jimmy and for Hannah and the decision they made to be obedient to you and step into the waters of baptism, but more importantly, the decision they made to chase after you, to follow you, to dedicate their lives to you. Please watch over them and protect them because the day any one of us chooses to do that, we wear a bullseye because the enemy would love nothing more than to bring us down and see us trip and stumble. So I ask for your protection around them and each one of us as we leave here today to enter into the mission field. Remember, that's where you're going. When you walk out these doors, we all know somebody or we will all encounter somebody that hasn't heard this message of hope. Maybe they, they've heard about Easter, but they don't believe it. Maybe they've heard the name of Jesus, but they don't know him. And you might be just the person to introduce them. So if you're bold, ask God to give you opportunity. If you're not, he may just do it anyway. So just pray, ask for strength and wisdom. I pray that as we leave here, we'll all represent him well. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, all God's people say.